Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And we are in the middle of Romania at War Week. And this is really the show of the three that really tackles the military side. The others are more the impact on peoples and deportations and Holocaust. So this one is more about the military side of things. Um, and viewing numbers have been a bit le uh, lower recently, which I completely understand. But I am so grateful. I want to publicly thank our guest today because he is the one who put me in contact really, with these other Romanian historians, so many, in fact, that I'll have enough to do another week about Romania in World War II at some point later in the year. So that's thanks to my guest for introducing me to a little another world of historians. So Grant Harwood is on his second show with us. He talked about his book uh, a few months ago. Well, is it last, it's last year, but more than a few months ago, and that was specifically about Odessa. But he's joining us again tonight to expand on that and kind of cover Romania's military history um, through the entire war. So without further ado, I'll introduce Grant. So good afternoon, Grant. How are you today? Hey, I'm, I'm really good. I'm glad to be here. And, uh, so again, and, uh, just, as, just, and just to get out of the way, I, yeah, I'm an employee of the U.S. Army, so I have to say that my opinions here are my own and do not represent the, uh, the, the position of the U.S. Army, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. Great. So that's out of the way. My disclaimer is done. <laughs> and I and I met, thank you. And I meant what I say about thank you to, for introducing me to these other historians because those who've been following World War II TV from the beginning, it is really important to me that we bring in people and experts from other countries. And I, I'm so grateful for people coming on speaking in their second or perhaps even third languages to our audience because as much as I love hearing from the the particular kind of British and American historian set that I have got to know these people over the years to expand our understanding has, has been so important. So it's a complicated subject. We were talking before um, going online there that there was obviously during Romania's communist era, access to archives was difficult and there's still a bit of baggage with dealing with this subject. But as an American, you know, you, you can look at it from the distance of an ocean perhaps. And do you think, as we get to talk about your book, that has given you a bit of a, a sort of a protection from some of the inner politics by writing you on the outside, although you do speak the language and you have lived there. Yeah, I definitely, I was asked a similar question by uh, some, like a, by a journalist and um, I have, I'll give, a, you know, my response there about, it really does kind of help like that, you know, I have a different perspective and an outsider's perspective. Um, there's, I have certain blind spots, you know, that certain that Romanians won't have, and I have issues with, you know, certain language, you know, not understanding certain things or culturalisms when I'm looking through the, looking through documents. But I do think that I've come at this uh, from a really good kind of almost as much as I can be unbiased perspective. I mean, I didn't know anything about Romania growing up, like not even in my mind that like Transylvania was in Romania, right? Um, I was called as a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, to Romania back in 2005, 2007. And that was really the first time that Romania like came up. I mean, um, in, in, and I really got to learn. And then I went there and lived there and learned the language. So like I went there as a missionary and could learn to really love the people. Right. So like I'm not coming at this as someone who has like this jaded, like anti-Romanian bias. I actually came through this first by, you know, going there and, you know, as a missionary, we're there taught to serve and teach and, you know, and I really do like love Romanian culture and the people and the language. And then it's after that, that I then started studying the history more and finding out more about, you know, issues such as the Holocaust, the anti-Roma, you know, anti-Gypsy racism, um, even yeah, well, finding out some about some of those things in the country when I was living there. But so it's like, I'm not coming at this as someone who has, you know, some kind of you know, lifelong, like, oh my gosh, I had this idea of Romania because I was, you know, an emigre or like some kind of, you know, bias. I'm coming, dropping in at this as an adult, learning the language, learning about the people and then learning the history. And I think that's helped me to be able to, as I decided to, you know, after my mission to go in and study Romania, when I'm reading these documents, reading these histories, starting to realize, hey, this traditional narrative that Romanian soldiers were supposedly reluctant you know, members of the Axis doesn't really line up with like the basic facts. And then as I started interviewing Romanian veterans and hearing what they said and how they justified the war, you know, really coming to understand like, hey, there's they were much more motivated and um, than I was led to believe by the kind of 
consensus history built off of emigre accounts and kind of apologist uh, histories written in the 90s. Well, that's a lovely uh, explanation of, of where you are now. So you've come armed, as all my guests uh, do, with a PowerPoint. And so I should remind people right away that the link to your book is in the description below. It wasn't out when you did the first show, but it is out now. It's Romania's Holy War. So, and it's, it's, it's essentially, it's one of the very few books available in English language by an American historian on this subject. You know, when, when I have someone on talking about Market Garden or Normandy, there's a plethora of books on Amazon <laughs> about these subjects, but you know, you're cornering a bit of a small market right now. So um, that's, Kudos to you for identifying something to write about that is interesting but hasn't hasn't been overly done. So we don't have too much too much historiography in terms of English language about this. So it's for most people who would buy your book, it's going to be a, a fresh a fresh study, a fresh aspect of World War II, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, this is the first book written in um, a couple decades. I mean, there is a non-academic, very worthwhile book called Third Axis, Fourth Ally by Mark Axworthy, that is very operations heavy and very technical focus on like planes and tanks and rifles and, you know, or orders of battle and, you know, that kind of stuff. I get more, I'm looking at more of a, the motivation of soldiers, but yeah, there's not much that's been translated about the army. There's a lot more on the Holocaust in Romania, but the military aspects is still mostly behind the wall of Romania. And there's a fair amount written in Romanian but most of that hasn't come across uh, yet. But uh, I thought we'd get started with, uh, and then move to the next slide if we're ready. Brilliant. All right, so basically we're gonna start off by addressing how Romania is usually addressed in most histories of the Eastern Front and most of the Axis allies. It's kind of a game of whack-a-mole. If you read a traditional military history of the Eastern Front, the Romanians, uh, Italians, Finns are kind of brought up in. 1941 as part of Operation Barbarossa. Like, oh yeah, these guys were there too. They disappear from the narrative. They pop back up um, around Stalingrad just in time for the Soviets to whack them down one by one. They disappear from the narrative again. Um, and then they start popping up basically um, each, each time a country decides to leave the axis. You know, when Romania leaves, switches sides or Finland signs peace and they pop up and get knocked down immediately. And that's usually how uh, we we view the Romanian army and the other Axis armies in the narrative. Um, so I'm hoping that this presentation will actually give you a sustained kind of complete narrative of Romania's uh, contribution, military contribution uh, to the Eastern Front, rather than being a whack-a-mole that we're actually going to follow the thread the whole way. Um, uh, next slide. And that makes sense, actually, Grant, because in some of the Eastern Front books I've read, it's like Romania comes up or the Romanian army comes up like a sort of a bridging chapter. Can I just kind of change the pace and change it? And then we'll go back into talking about loads and loads of rifle divisions in the Soviet, in the Red Army again. It just seems to be there just to give the book a bit of a, a, a difference partway through. And then, as you say, they don't appear in the narrative again. Then suddenly 12 chapters on, they'll come back in it again. So it's good to have the whole story from beginning to end. So I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, it, it reminds me of an old SNL sketch with uh, Will Ferrell and Christopher Walken when they're talking. They're in like the, the jacuzzi and the old, they're talking about, you know, making love, whatever. And the other guy's like, and I was there, too. And that's kind of Romania's like, you know, it's like there were Stalingrad and the Romanians pop up and I was there, too. It's like, you know, every once in a while, you know, they mention and it's yeah, it's a little bit of like, oh, we got to shove these guys in. And I think because of that, that's one of the reasons why we don't understand why Romanians fought. And it's another, really, I think it's a major reason why people are willing to believe that Romanian soldiers were unmotivated because the historians are like, what are the Romanians doing there? Well, you know, if we don't know what they're doing there and some literature says that the Romanians didn't want to be there, then yeah, then they didn't want to be there. But um, as, I'm, as this slide is showing, they actually had, a, a, they actually understood why they, why they were there you know, as, as far as far away as Stalingrad or in the Caucasus and what they were fighting for. Um, and I want to uh, introduce the Romanian army and took looking at the ideological underpinning. And so well, the motivation, and, uh, primarily ideological, that of Romanian soldiers. So you can see in this slide, there's a map, um, which I think is helpful um, 
to show how Romania had doubled and more than doubled in size. So there's the old kingdom is that kind of like a gray, darker color. Uh, the gray green is what it was before the first world war. And it's doubled in size by annexing these, these territories. Um, and so Romania has, you know, gotten larger and this is kind of in interwar Romania there because of this, you know, expansion of, of Romania through force of arms, they've extended, you know, citizenship rights. Um, your previous uh, speakers, Adrian and uh, Amadeus have t had talked about this a bit. And this has also led to more in, uh, popular politics because all of a sudden all Romanian men could vote. Before then they had kind of a limited system of, uh, of uh, and so this leads to the rise of these right-wing uh, groups, <clears throat> include leagues, including like the fascists, and so I kind of this, all this is to point out that Romania was not this unideological country. It was had very strong nationalism. By by the expansion, they've included all these minorities. So there's kind of you went from being ninety percent Romanian to being more like seventy percent Romanian, which then increased nationalist sentiment among many Romanians because they felt like they were being like uh, overrun by Jews, by Hungarians, etc. <clears throat> Romania, you know, this religion is really important as an ideology, especially when it gets to the war, you know, that they see themselves as like Romanian Orthodox. That is because all of a sudden there's all these other peoples, you know, there's some Romanian uh, Greek Catholics in Transylvania. Then there's other, you know, there's Protest German Protestants. And so a big part of your identity was not just your language of Romanian, but now had to be your religion of Orthodoxy. <clears throat> Of course, we had, you know, Adrian addressed anti-Semitism. Um, this pervaded the country, you know, as he pointed out, it has very deep roots um, in, the, in the episode yesterday. Also anti-communism, which is often kind of cited, but, and then kind of dismissed. But this is a very powerful ideology. I mean, the U.S. and the Western world fought the Cold War, right, for 50 years based on anti-communism. Um, and then, like I said, fascism. The fascists never take over. But because of uh, their activism in the um, interwar period, Romanian politics is very pushed to the right. And you have to remember, Romania has very few workers, you know, a few railroad workers, some oil workers. So these are the people, workers are the ones most likely to identify or sympathize with socialism or communism. And there just simply aren't that many. Most of Romanians, like 70, 80 percent, are peasants, right, who fear losing their land to communism, you know, fear collectivization. Um, and the same, you know, the middle class and, and the large landowners, similarly. So this, you know, whether you're rich or poor, because, you know, in Romania, you fear communism and you hate it, you know, especially as after what they've, uh, what they've seen happen in the Russian Civil War. Um, other th aspects of motivation, right, their comradeship, this very famous primary group that has been emphasized. Um, Romania had the army use strict discipline. Um, it reintroduced flogging during uh, the war. It was willing to shoot soldiers uh, for desertion, or rather, mainly desertion, and sometimes, uh, and um, though not very often, and uh, as often as you know, as it was actually happened, they were more likely to uh, send them back to the front. Um, they were likely to shoot uh, self-inflicted wounds, people who you know self did self-inflicted wounds. Um, but so, so there is, but when it, you compare that to Nazi Germany. Or Russia, or the, I mean the USSR, the Red Army and the German Army were much more brutal, brutal and much more willing to shoot soldiers. Um, so the Romanians, they did have strict discipline, but it wasn't quite as murderous. Um, also honor, there, there's still like that sense of honor. They're going to see, need to take revenge for that. And then finally propaganda, right? The reinforcing mostly that ideological component, right? The underlying Romanian society. Um, so yeah, next slide. So kind of the de facto start, most Romanian military histories start in 1941 with the invasion of Barbarossa. And before we get there, I want to point out that the real start to Romania's Holy War is a year earlier. Um, there's the Soviets, uh, you know, right after the fall of France, the Soviets um, sent an ultimatum demanding um, Bessarabia, uh, Bessarabia, the eastern part of Romania, and northern Bukovina. Bessarabia had been in the secret protocols of the Nazi Soviet pact. And then the, the Germans had recognized Soviet uh, pretensions or, you know, 
claims to Bessarabia. But then Stalin also nabs northern Bukovina, which actually had been Austro-Hungarian territory, which is alarming to the Germans and helps lead to the collapse of uh, the non, you know, the ribbon, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. Anyway, this is a very forgotten episode. It's often rushed over by Romanian historians. The ones that don't rush over it use it um, just to kind of show how bad the Soviets were and often to reinforce a myth of Jewish betrayal. Because as you see in this map, um, the Romanians decide not to fight, but and they have to carry out a withdrawal, but the Soviets only give them four days. And the Soviets, they have a much more mechanized army and so in certain, the, over the, those four days, they actually start overtaking Romanian columns and disarming them. And often locals, including local ethnic Romanians, will sometimes join in and mocking the Romanian soldiers, stealing their stuff, spitting on them, throwing rocks, in part because the Romanians had mobilized 1.1 million soldiers to try to deter any aggression. And as part of that mobilization, they'd also requisitioned forces carts, motorcycles, vehicles from the local populace. So all of a sudden the Romanian army is retreating and they might be taking your horse cart and your team of horses, right? So you're a local peasant, you don't wanna see the army take that stuff. And then Romanian army would all sometimes basically start looting ethnic German or Jewish you know, um, stores and then try to grab that stuff. Um, so anyway, and you can see here, I'm really proud of this map. I had it made because I've never seen this map shown of how the, this operation took place. And while it was, although the Romanians didn't um, offer, res, you know, official, res, you know, uh, organized resistance, there were several skirmishes and there were kind of incidents where there were a few Romanian soldiers shot and Soviet soldiers shot um, during this evacuation. So it was on kind of near, you know, combat conditions in many ways. As you can see, there was a par parachute drop down there in the south of Bessarabia, uh, cutting off railroads. Um, and there was, um, you know, a kind of major skirmish down in the south there where the Romanians held on to a bridgehead um, and before blowing up the bridges. Um, and very importantly, um, I'm not going to focus. We've already had Adrian yesterday talk so much about the Holocaust. I'm still going to bring it up. but. Uh, I'm not going to, this is not going to be as much focused on the Holocaust events, but it's interesting that during this, immediately during this retreat, the Romanians start targeting Jews. They start arresting them, shooting them, blaming them as being fifth columnists of helping the Soviets, directing the Soviets. Um, and there's actually a pogrom in Dorohoi, which is in the north. You can see on the map, it's marked there in the northern part, where several hundred Jews are murdered um, by Romanian soldiers. And then, and then, Adrian uh, spoke yesterday about a massacre down in Galatz, um, where, where Jews who were trying to get to Bessarabia, where their homes were, were you know were murdered by John Um So yeah, I mean it's, it's really interesting that no one's covered this airborne drop. Um, there, it's it's there actually seemed to be have been an actual drop, although there was also um, just basically an airlift of soldiers. It seemed like as well as like they kind of drop some from troops that the so it's a, it's a small it, it's like the Guderev um detachment it's only like 500 uh paratroopers or something but they spread a lot of panic and see some like you know important railways and stuff um uh but following that you know so there's this the Romanian army is completely humiliated there's actually also some bad behavior by Romanian officers some of them like abandon their troops or like you know, you know, run to go rescue their wives first. And so there's this, you know, stain on the, the, the honor of the Reign Army for having not fought to defend um, against Bessarabia. And then there's this added trauma of this being disarmed. Several, so, several officers commit suicide because they've been disarmed. You know, this is, this, is, this is publicized by the armies, you know, saying, look at these terrible Jewish communists and how they've persecuted us. This is going to be really important later. And there's not similar events um, when they turn over territory because basically Hungary and Bulgaria are already friends with Nazi Germany. Having lost this territory, Romania wants to join the Axis. And the price is part of the price of getting German troops to come to Romania to hold off any kind of further Soviet 
occupation is to make territorial concessions to uh, Nazi Germany's current allies of Hungary and Bulgaria. So as you see these other shaded regions, Northern Transylvania is given to Hungary in the, in, in the Northeast, the Northwest there, and then Southern Dobruja is given to the Bulgarians. But these are not traumatic. The Hungarian and Bulgarian armies aren't mechanized. These come after negotiations. The, there's like strict regulations to prevent any incidents. The Romanian army is kind of able to, you know, keep its honor. And there's just not this ideological fear. You know, there's not this association of Hungarians and Jews and or Hungarians and Bulgarians like there is with Jews and communism, right? That's much more threatening. The USSR is much bigger military threat. And then there's this ideological component that it's not just, you know, a, an, another nation it's this godless Jewish, you know, pariah state, right? Um, and so there's a military impact. You know, you lose a bunch of soldiers. You lose all this territory. The Romanian army is going to lose some soldiers, is you know, population. You can't recruit them. So it actually has. It actually kind of suffers a battle, like a defeat, um, even before the war really get, even before it really starts, uh, joins the war. And so you, a lot of the regiments are pared down, some of the divisions have to be, you know, disbanded. Um, and so they go from like four field armies to three, well, that they can, and two that they can actually field and one that's gonna be in reserve for the rest of the army. But like I said, that psychological impact is really important. And that photo at the bottom shows Soviet soldiers, you know, uh, Romanian soldiers being disarmed, you're kind of turning over weapons and stuff to the Soviets. And just to add the fact that you had to have that ma map made is representing the fact that it, this era hasn't really been talked about. I mean, it, and it is from a purely kind of selling a book point of view, starting with Barbarossa is a really good, because everyone's heard of Barbarossa. You go, oh, the Romanian army starts with Barbarossa and the maps already exist. You haven't got to commission new maps because you just, you can already find the Romanian army on Barbarossa maps. But this era, complicated, different countries, different regions, borders are different. Uh, you've got to bring the Soviets in, the Romanians in. The, it's, I can see why people just kind of skip ahead and start at the bit everybody knows. So well done for taking us through that complicated but in, important era. Well, and it's also for Romanian history, military historians. It allows them to skip over the nasty reality of how of the ideological underpinnings of this holy war. They can skip straight to they kind of address this and they present it in very like real politique, very kind of you know cold and calculated like Romania had no other choice this was a coldly cold ca coldly calculated you know diplomatic decision to choose the Nazis over you know the Soviets rather than if you look at actually happens it's like this is a visceral fear of communism and Judaism that makes Romania swing decisively into the Nazi orbit and contribute so much later but if you start the if you start your account in 1941 you can skip all that kind of complicated and embarrassing mm -hmm. ideological underpinning of the war and switch to Romania was just, you know, kind of an aggrieved party that joined in, not really wanting to, but just to get like its territory back. And I mean, that's, that's, that's the narrative that I've kind of yeah. understood is, is the, a reluctant partner. And it, and yeah, the, the, your, your explanation of the, the more complicated, but important, journey to 1941 i think is important so are we, are we moving on now i think we are yeah so here's just a few incidents of kind of once again highlighting anti-semitism the two flyers uh in blue um were put up you know so it's like an evil jew showing you know directing the bolshevik to destroy christianity you can see a sweaty kind of capitalist jew you know leading the the russian bear into Bessarabia, 1940 uh there's fat capitalist jews who are you know, exploiting peasants down to the, the, the left there. And then you can't always really see the other one, but that's like a man being taken away from his family by the, by the Soviets under Soviet occupation. So once again, there's this very connection, like the Soviets and Jews are connected. This is really important to understand why Romanian soldiers are going to be willing to fight because they, they have this big, wider ideological worldview of this threat. They're not fighting just for territory, but to destroy this bigger threat of Jewish communism. Next slide. Um, so just talking a little bit about um, preparations, Romania actually, they're pushed, they want this war to happen, but they don't really know when it's going to happen. And 
they're facing all kind of internal political problems um, during the winter, so they're not really preparing for it. The Germans, however, are preparing for the Operation Barbarossa and are not telling the Romanians. Um, and they're helped by the fact that you have this last minute campaign in Greece and Yugoslavia, which then means this buildup for Barbarossa is obscured and the Romanians think it's just kind of part of this punitive campaign into Yugoslavia or to kick out the, the British from, from Greece. So it's very late that you have um, all of a sudden in late May when the Romanians are really kind of realizing, hey, this is, this is the, there are actually something bigger going on here. You have um, General Eugen von Schubert, who's in the middle there at the bottom. He's the one who's going to kind of, he's the 11th German left army commander um, who's taking over the German forces that are going to be involved. Um, you can see here, there's the first meeting that addresses a future war is the 31st of May. It's only on the 12th of June that Hitler and Antonescu meet. You can see them in the meeting there in the top photo. And he, Hitler doesn't even tell him the war is, he says something's going to happen. So this isn't, he isn't really informing him about Romania's mission. He's just like, hey, get ready. Um, and so it's not until the 18th of June, you know, four days beforehand that Hitler says, okay, you know, we're going to war and here's the Romanian um, role that it's going to basically kind of uh, protect the oil fields for a while and then join in the invasion, um, at least to regain Bessarabia. Um, but there's already kind of bigger ideas. So the Romanians create Army Group Antonescu. This is the often forgotten fourth army group in Operation Barbarossa. And so it's technically underneath Antonescu's control and underneath the Marele Cartier General. This is the great uh, general headquarters. It's created from the Romanian general staff. So it's basically just a general staff, but it's it's a kind of remnant of the monarchy, you know, that so the headquarters gets it's kind of a field headquarters created from the general staff. Um, and so Antonescu actually goes to the front with the chief of the uh, chief of staff and then with some uh, German uh, staff advisors as well. But really, von Schubert is running the show. This, you know, Antonescu kind of co-signs orders. Um, uh, and interestingly, the th Romanian Third Army under Petr Dumitrescu, he's there on the bottom left. Um, he is going to control the best Romanian units, the uh, cavalry units, uh, mountain units, and a few of these specially trained uh, by German, um, like about five infantry divisions. Um, and he's actually, that army is actually put under German 11th Army at the start. And there's, it's implied that the Romanians are basically going to follow third of uh, a German 11th Army, um, what far beyond uh, Bessarabia, northern Bukovina and Bessarabia. It, you know, they're already planning on going into the Soviet Union even before the war starts, which is important because later on, historians kind of claim that the Romanians weren't, uh, that they made this decision later. And then finally, there's the Fourth Army. That's the rest of the Romanian army we, um, under Nikolai Chuperka there on the bottom right. And Chuperka, um, his army kind of is the rest of the army. It's just infantry. There's some border. There's a border uh, guards uh, division. It's, uh, it's not as well equipped, not as well trained. Like all the best trained troops, all the best art mobile artillery, the most modern stuff is all with Third Army and often actually just assigned to German 11th Army. And even the Romanian uh, armored division, its sole armored division is placed under uh, German 11th Army. So like, and German 11th Army, it, it has, it's, a, it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a panzer army, has very few tanks, very few. And so it's relying on the Romanian armored division, the Romanian, uh, motorized cavalry divisions, which have tanks, um, to actually provide most of its like maneuver power, um, you know, reinforced with whatever, you know, uh, kind of motorized units it has. So, you know, which is kind of interesting here where like the Romanians are the ones who are providing that kind of power to uh, the German attack. And All what's right. the ratio of kind of um, volunteers and conscripts? I mean, it's a very, it's a, it's a rabbit hole of a question. But you know, you were talking about some of the units being kind of quite good and some being not so good. So, what, what's the makeup of how, how has Romania got itself to a point where it's got an army of this size? So there, the, the, there's about three hundred twenty-six thousand Romanian troops that are in this. Um, then the the Germans are about one hundred twenty-five thousand, so roughly twice as many Romanians. About 100,000 of those are with Third Army, and they're the kind of the elite, the cavalry troops, uh, the, the mountain troops. 
um, these better trained infantry, and about 200,000 are the fourth army. And it's a conscript army. It goes back, you know, they've had a, uh, a drafty army through the interwar period. Um, because of the war coming out, they've actually mobilized starting in 38 and then a general mobilization in 39. So you actually have these guys are better trained. They've had some like last minute training. Um, it's been disrupted because of what happens in 1940 with the occupation of Bessarabia. But you'd have to think like they're, they're kind of at their best in some ways. They're kind of at their height. They're the best, most well equipped. They've been they've been mobilized for a longer period, so they've had more training. Um, kind of, but overall, the Romanian army does suffer from inferior training, less well less well able officers, and especially uh, a shortage of equipment. You know, they don't have very many trucks, very few anti tank guns, <clears throat> few anti aircraft guns. Especially when you know you know even in comparison to like a German run of the mill infantry division, so they do have less firepower and less mobility. Um, and they're less well trained, and they don't really have a professional um, non-commissioned officer corps, and that's going to, which is a problematic. But you know, by this point, after like several years of kind of being mobilized, it's pretty, it's 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 pretty ready for this. It's about as ready as it could get. Um, okay. And we'll just do a couple of questions from from the viewers, then we'll let you carry on. So this is about sure. uh, von Schubert um, having served in the Great War, and if he did, did he participate in operations against Romania in that conflict? That's an easy question to answer because I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, that's <clears throat> good. That's honest there. And the next one is a comment really about from David K about. With Romania being heavily agricultural, having that many men mobilized, was that put having an impact on Romania's ability to feed itself? Oh, huge impact. And actually point out in my book, so while they do have time to train, but that spring, because they don't know the war's coming, um, they actually, a lot of the soldiers, you know, are sent out to help seed the harvest, especially because they lost all this territory. There's all these like food crises and, and because all of a sudden, wheat that came from Bessarabia is no longer available. Um, and so in like, you know, in, and so in the spring, because they don't realize Barbarossa is happening and they need to make sure there's food in the fall, they actually use a lot of soldiers, including the, you know, cavalrymen, including mountain troops, you know, the better trained ones. They're actually not training for battle. They're helping seed the fields. And they also are using, because once again, they've requisitioned parts and horses from the peasants so the army has to bring them kind of back and help the peasants, you know, plant the, uh, plant the, the heart, you know, plant the fields. Wow. Um, so yeah, there is that problem. So it, they are facing economic issues and having that many men and that's, uh, they aren't going to mobilize quite as many men as they did in 1940 and 1941. Like I said, they could have contributed three armies. They're only going to do two because they need some of those men back home, you know, working the fields. Okay, super. We'll move on. And I've just looked up on Wikipedia, and von Schobert was only on the Western Front in a Bavarian regiment. So I think that answers that answers that question. He spent his entire war there in the First World War. So Operation Barbarossa. Here we go. Um, I want to just a quick point out. You can kind of look at this, but Romania declares war the, on the twenty second of June, and not only does it declare war, it provides troops. You know that in contrast. Italy declares war, but troops don't show up for several months. Hungary and Finland, they wait for provocations, basically Soviet airstrikes, before they declare war, so they can kind of... But for the Romanians, they declare war day one, in part because the war's already started, like I said, a year ago. Yeah. Um, and you can see the, the number of troops the Romanians commit is large, right? 226,000 men, eventually almost over 400,000. The Finns contribute more, but they don't advance beyond their borders really. And they begin demobilizing that fall. Whereas you're going to see the, the Romanians immediate, almost immediately cross their old borders uh, and then seize terror and actually annex territory and fight deep into the Soviet union. So you can see right there that there's this difference between the Romanians and how committed they are compared to these other countries uh, to the battle on the Eastern front. All right. Um, so here's a, a map kind of of the first phase of Operation Bar you know, kind of, of the war of Operation Barbarossa, showing from the border battles um, in, in eastern Romania through uh, 
southern Ukraine. You're going to see a lot of these places being discussed in the news today. Odessa, Nikolaev, uh, Kherson. Um, they're all Romanian soldiers, you know, all go through all those areas. And they have these photos up here to remind us, once again, that you can see the advancing troops in the upper left crossing the river. Um, in, the, in the lower left, they're like being welcomed by peasants is one of their armored units. But in the right, you can see Jews being rounded up in Yash. Uh, there's a, um, and then other Jews in, uh, in Bukovina, Bessarabia being rounded up to, to be shot or deported. So once again, I'm not really gonna go into this. Adrian did that yesterday. But it's important to remember that wherever Romanian soldiers are advancing, especially in, uh, in Bessarabia, Bukovina, they're committing atrocities and they will continue mm -hmm. to commit atrocities even then in, in Transnistria, which they annex, and I'm, something I point out in Ukraine and Crimea, uh, which often is overlooked because it's outside the boundaries of Romania's kind of occupation zone during the war. <clears throat> so next slide. So like I said, the kind of liberation and invasion, right? So for some of you know, for some people, ethnic Romanians, they were welcoming the Romanian the Romanian army. The U local Ukrainian population were kind of so so. They were welcoming the Germans. You know the German 11th Army, but for Jews, for other minorities, this is not a liberation, right? This is an invasion. Um, so interestingly, there's these bridgehead battles for the first, you know, kind of week or so um, after the after the invasion is declared. So remain, they want to wait. They don't want Romania to attack immediately because the Germans are still plowing through, having to penetrate through Poland, right? And they want they want army groups north, center, and south to kind of catch up to where the Romanian frontier is before the Romanian, uh, before army group Antonescu goes on the offensive, because if army group Antonescu attacks too quickly, it might be able to get kind of destroyed or hurt too badly, right? And then be useless. Uh, but they'd also want to try to pin the Russians down. So kind of the Germans and Romanians jump over the Prut River at multiple locations and fight these bridgehead battles. The Soviets actually have a lot of equipment and soldiers in Ukraine in comparison to some of their other areas. And so they're actually able to counterattack and even eliminate some of these bridgeheads. And actually, they actually come across, they, they have uh, several crossings into Romania across the Prut. And these are some of the reasons why you have this pogrom in Yash is because there is kind of fear that, oh, we, you know, like this war has started. There's Jew, you know, there's a lot of Jews in, in, in Moldavia, especially in, in these cities like Yash. Oh my gosh! Are the Soviets going to be breaking through? Are they going to link up? Are all these Jews going to rise up? And that's one of the reasons why you have a pogrom in Yash, um, uh, because of this paranoia. But the uh, and over once after that about week, and as army group uh, German army group South approaches, then Romania goes in like a full offensive, um, and they're able to kind of especially with German 11th, 11th Army up north with the Third Army able to punch through in part because the Soviets realize they have to start retreating because the, the army group South is, is threatening to encircle them. Um, so then it kind of turns into, into a pursuit by third army. There's kind of like this um, maneuver where they kind of clear out Northern Bukovina, the German 11th army using Romanian, a, a lot of Romanian troops pushes through the Northern Bessarabia Fourth Army has problems down in the south. It gets stuck, has a, a bloody battle. But fairly quickly, as you can see here, they start overrunning um, these former Romanian territories. And really interestingly, it's on the 16th of July. So very quickly, the Romanians are already, Third Army is already crossing the border into the Soviet Union, along with the German 11th Army to push for, forward. So Third Army has like a secondary function. It's mainly kind of um, flank support. It's kind of the guard, the the flank of German 11th Army, which is doing most of like the penetrating and pushing forward. And then Romanian 4th Army is down in the south, and kind of you know, kind of slowly advancing. Um, but once again, a lot of the, the early penetrations are by, you know, Romanian armor, Romanian cavalrymen under German command. Um, once you have Bessarabia as well fully liberated. Army Group Antonescu is dissolved, um, and so, but Germany. You know, so once again, so you kind of get split in half. Where the German 11th Army and Third Army are 
already in Ukraine advancing towards Nikolaev. And then you have on um, the 31st of July, um, you have and, um, Antonescu tell Hitler after Hitler asks him, hey, will you send the fourth army because, you know, across the Dniester River uh, towards Odessa? And Antonescu says, I will go to the end of the line. And it also commits that army. So by that point, you have the full invasion, Romanian invasion force, all in the Soviet, uh, former Soviet, uh, all in Soviet territory. Um, you know, this fourth army crosses on the 2nd of August. <clears throat> and you can see here this propaganda photo of the um, the Soviet kind of Hydra with a, a Jewish star of David tail being confronted by the Romanian and German soldier in, uh, on the Eastern Front. Uh, next slide. So I want to, I don't want to, can't, I don't want to spend too much um, time on this. Uh, this needs really like a whole episode on self, but um, the fourth army in the South, which like I said, is not as well equipped. Most of its heavy artil best hard, heavy artillery has been sent to the Germans or Romanian third army. It's tasked with trying to take Odessa. And the Soviets decide to make a fight for this. Um, they've created three uh, concentric rings of defense. And the Romanians are able to kind of, oh, I think there's actually four. No, there's three. And the Romanians are able to get through the first one pretty quickly when they run up against the second one and become bogged down. It's very flat terrain, but there's a few kind of, you know, slight hills that the Soviets have time to build all these trenches, concrete emplacements, and they have all these heavy artillery guns, coastal artillery and um, what do you call it? And uh, naval artillery, naval guns. Plus they can bring in aircraft from Crimea and reinforcements by sea as long as they hold the port. Um, so this proves to be a really tough nut to crack. And there's going to be, two um, major uh, assaults that fail um, as, the, as the Romanians are fighting here in Odessa um, through the beginning of uh, August, and then we'll see where it ends up. But I don't want, I can't spend too much time on this, but this is a really important thing because this allows um, Army Group South to keep going because Odessa is a big threat to the logistics of the German army um, he heading eastwards. And so the Romanians are doing a really important job here um, although they're kind of being outfought by the smaller force, but the smaller force can get reinforced as interior lines. And, you know, the Romanians, they don't have as much heavy artillery uh, to try to get them out of their trenches. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, so really interesting. Uh, there's a change in command. Von Schubert, he's killed. He lacked his, his, uh, his liaison craft, he's in his liaison plane. He lands on a minefield um, and he's killed. So he's replaced by von Manstein. This is pretty famously known, but there's also the Romanian chief of staff, uh, General uh, Ion, uh, Alexandru Ioannitsu. He's killed on the 17th of September in an accident. He came outside of Odessa to kind of watch uh, one of the attacks that's going to be unfolding. And when he stepped out of his airplane, he accidentally stepped into the propeller, which kind of cracked, you know, basically hit on the head and killed him. Um, he's this tall guy on the left of this photograph of Antonescu with German um, uh, German officers. Um, he's a kind of it's a major blow because he worked really well with Antonescu, who is uh, well known for kind of having a bad personality. He's so Ioannitsu is replaced by. General Yosef Yakubic, who was actually the Minister of Defense. He's a guy on the left in the kind of the profile photo. Mm -hmm. um, so he, um, but he also takes over command of Romanian Fourth Army because Chuperka is kind of having a breakdown. His are his soldiers, he suffered tens of thousands of casualties. He doesn't think that you can that they can take the city without more German help. So Yakubic comes in and takes over, and he he organizes um, another uh, major um, assault uh, that fails, even after some a few battalions of German like engineers and heavy artillery show up. That even the Germans can't break through these really stiff uh, Russian de uh, Soviet defenses. Antonescu, meanwhile, he goes home. He gets promoted to marshal. He goes home to become minister of defense for a little. Uh, he's both conducator, you know the Fuhrer, the leader, and he's also Minister of Defense. 
And he once after they've liberated Bessarabia, he kind of steps back from his, being in field command uh, and leaves it to Jakubic or and Dumitrescu to command these armies. So while the remaining fourth army is stuck outside Odessa, the remaining third army is advancing quickly alongside German 11th army to the Dnieper and beyond. It helps with close the Uman pocket. Um, then it's not until you cross the Boog River that there's some signs that maybe Romanian soldiers are kind of starting to wonder like, hey, why are we still fighting? And this is because for a, for a time, the Germans thought the Romanians would stop at the Boog River. And they actually, von, um, von Schubert, before he's killed, um, actually does an official farewell, and thanks the Romanians for all their help. And that goes down, that, that's, that's relayed down the ranks. So like, you know, the Germans are telling the Romanians, yeah, your part in the war is over. Thanks, thanks for your help. You know, we've, we've got this. And then a few weeks, then like a, a, you know, a few days later, they decide actually the Soviets are fighting even harder. You know, we need these troops still. Um, and so then Antonescu decides to um, continue to push the uh, Romanian Third Army further east in exchange for um, taking territory, basically. Uh, that's the Tegina Agreement. Um, Vladimir Solonati, we'll talk about that tomorrow. But that's where they're going to get Transnistria, this occupied territory from. It's basically, you know, give us this territory to annex and we'll give you more troops, which goes to show just how important Romanian troops are. Because mm. the Nazis don't like giving over, especially Hitler doesn't like giving these other countries, you know, territory that they claim. And do you um, think you see that, the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. this is a crucial period? Because as you said there, change of leadership, the Odessa story, which we could expand on in a future show, has been, you know, a, a critical point for the Romanian army. And now they're well beyond, way beyond territorially the bits they could justify. We're just taking back what's ours. So the whole mindset is changing now. The the, the personnel leading it is changed. The, the motivation has changed a bit. And there's been this Odessa kind of in the back of their mind that hasn't worked out so well. So is that fair, a fair assessment that there's kind of that's kind of a critical moment? Yeah, for in the in the uh, Barbarossa invasion, this is a very critical moment for the Romanians, um, where they decide to keep at this battle at Odessa, uh, but also to keep going further east. You know, one of the reasons they're doing this is because if they can outperform, outcontribute the Hungarians, they think that they can get northern Transylvania given back to them. Right. That Hitler would be like, oh wow, Romania. You did so much more to contribute to the final defeat of Jewish Bolshevism than Hungary. Here, here's your land back. So that's also another thing that's going on. Um, and they say this in orders. I mean, um, if you see the the individual in the beret, that's um, uh, Gheorghe, General Gheorghe Avramescu. He's the commander of the Mountain Corps. And a lot of his soldiers are from like the Trans Transylvania area. And he's constantly kind of harping on this, like, you know, on orders of the day and stuff. Uh, Rako, uh, uh, that's uh, E. Mihail Rakovica. Uh, he's the general in command of Cavalry Corps. Uh, to the right, he's a real asshole, uh, to put it bluntly. Um, I don't, he, he will find, I, I don't have time to talk about it, but he, he Avramescu, he was, I don't know, he was decent enough. Rakovica really pushed killing Jews. Um, he will see that he gets, he kind of abandons um, his commands when it looks like that there's no, there's going to be no more victories. Uh, I, and he's a turncoat later on. Anyway, he, he goes and works for the Soviets later on after Romania switches sides. I don't, he's a, a character. Um, but then the map is showing that there's this, the, the, so whereas the Romanians are, our third army is providing flank um, support for a while by this point their Germans are so desperate that they're starting to put the Romanians into more important um, um, combat including this battle in the Azov Sea um, that will allow um, uh, the Germans to break into Crimea uh, which I won't go into too much detail but it's one more battle but it's, it's really interesting because it's and it's a battle where um German panzers actually link up with Romanian motorized cavalry to encircle the, the Soviets. 
So no one talks about this, but this is, once again, these few Romanian mobile troops uh, are really important to helping the Germans kind of have these certain, some of these smaller encirclements that get less press uh, in the narrative. All right. Next one. Um, so these are scenes from, you know, the kind of the final fall of Odessa. Um, you know, and you, you know, if you look at photos today, they've put up sandbags around the opera house and around the city that looks somewhat similar to this. Um, the Soviets, because the Germans had that victory in the sea battle of Azov with Romanian help, they're going to break, they're breaking into Crimea. The Soviets decide to evacuate Odessa and bring those troops to help defend Crimea. Um, the Romanian Fourth Army is so worn down, it really can't prevent this. It tries to, it harries them. And you can see there's a bunch of like destroyed um, Soviet weapons, like tanks, trucks on the streets that they couldn't evacuate. So this is often presented as like a skillful Soviet evacuation that, in you know, but really it was more complicated. With the Romanians, they couldn't stop the evacuation, but they did inflict a lot of damage and take a lot of prisoners still, even though most of the Soviet troops got away. Uh, but they also were able to destroy a lot of equipment. And you can see like, I think that's all uh, mortars or machine guns uh, uh, in the bottom left corner there. Like, big captures that's you know so it's not as clean of an operation as is usually presented but this is really important because after the siege is over uh, of odessa the fourth most of fourth army is demobilized and sent home because the romanians a they think the war is almost over the germans have in the bag and b the germans they see their the fourth army troops is not really worthwhile the third army troops are like hey these are these are good, good troops. We can use them. Fourth Army, you know, Romanian troops, they're not so well trained. And look how long it took them to take Odessa, even though the Germans are failing to take Leningrad, but that's not. But the Germans also, thirdly, they can't support another Romanian army. They can barely supply their own forces. They and they also have to supply Romanian Third Army. There's no way that they can supply the Romanian Fourth Army. So the Germans don't try to get the Romanians to like keep more soldiers um, other than to provide several corps to help occupy territory. So uh -huh. not all of fourth army is demobilized. There's a corps that's going to be, uh, if you go to the next map, uh, next, the next slide, oh, I'll show up, but well, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but yeah, so there's this idea that there's this victory, right? Odessa falls, the Germans break into Crimea. They need help. Once again, there's kind of this repeated, like, oh, we don't need the we don't need the Romanians for the Crimea. Then they break in, they realize, oh crap, we need more men on the ground, and they ask for Romanian troops. And Third Army sends, uh, you know, the Mountain Corps, which is a bit of a misnomer because it's actually like a mountain brigade and a cavalry brigade and some infantry. Um, but and and but it seems at this point in October for the Romanians that like they're just going to be mopping up that you're going to have some occupation duties and that you're going to help mop up uh, resistance in the Crimea and the Germans are going to win outside Moscow. Um, and if you go to the next map, you kind of show, it shows um, this, right? You can see this is Southern Ukraine. The Transnistria is where second Corps is. The Romanians are annexing that. The yellow area is this area that's six Corps occupying. And then the Cavalry Corps is helping guard the Azov Sea a coast and the mountain core is helping to take Crimea. And this is kind of where they think the war is going to end. But instead you have the Soviet winter counter offensive, which throws, you know, everyone back and surprises everybody. Um, so you have this winter crisis, you know, these Soviet landings in, around Christmas, the Romanians actually help fight them off, even though they're pushed back. It gives the Germans enough time to set up a defense. There's also a breakthrough at Izium in, um, Ukraine, which is actually very near Kharkiv, where there's, I think there's Russian troops cousin, coming out of Izium right now in the war that's going on. And this crisis causes another important uh, change in leadership. I'm kind of emphasizing some of these generals that a lot of the viewers won't have heard of, but are still important. Um, so Yakubich, he's of the mind that, hey, the game's up. We're not good enough. We should have a minimum commitment. But he's in the minority. 
Uh, he's been made chief of staff again, and he's fired. He he gives his resignation, and Antonescu accepts it. Antonescu then he really he no longer he he has uh, General Ilya Shteflia become the chief of staff. He's the man on the left, <clears throat> and then he makes um, uh, General Konstantin Pantanzi the minister of war. And so it's going to be that you know Antonescu, Shteflia, and Pantanzi they're going to go the rest of the war organizing the war effort. So, you know, this is a kind of a triumvirate that works fairly well together. And they're agreed on the fact that Romania needs to do a maximum commitment to try to destroy the Soviet Union and Jewish Bolshevism rather than, you know, a minimum commitment to try to kind of like, you know, save its troops and like Yakubich wanted. So it's doubling down, du double or quits at this point. Right. And which really makes a lot more sense in, in a lot of ways. But Yakubich kind of had this idea of like, Let's send the bare minimum and then try to hope that, you know, there's a negotiated peace. And Antonescu and these two, and most of the Romanian army is more about if we don't defeat the Soviets now, there's not going to be any peace to try to negotiate. Right. We're, we have to, you know, double down on this bet. <clears throat> so now we're getting to the, the spring recovery. There's, there's, you know, there's, it's it's an ebbing and flowing situation here and and this you know the, the sidebar is full of conversations grant about david Stahl's books and of course there's um uh others on this campaign there's a lot going on there and if when people are first getting into the eastern front it as we've always said it covers a vast area but i think so much focus goes on the, the northern shoulder of barbarossa just because it's the it's the Russian cities, and this area here is is the the poorer cousin, uh, and possibly more complicated to explain as well because of the Romanian army and the, the changes of command. But incredibly fascinating. So um, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, I mean, so during 1941 in Barbarossa, uh, the Southern Front is kind of is secondary, right? It's not as important as the main drive on Moscow, which everyone you look if you read this, uh, David's books, which are great, he's focusing on Army Group Center. Because yeah. it's the most important. He has one book on Army Group South with um, Battle of Kiev, but mostly on Army Group Center. Um, the Romanians, so the Romanians at first, they're in this like secondary theater, but we're going to see by the summer, it becomes the, the primary theater, the main theater, which is why they, you know, you know, this is where they get their bad rap at Stalingrad. But you have first have this spring recovery that's impossible without the Romanians. I don't want to go into, once again, I can't get into too much detail, but Without the Romanian contribution and reinforcements, they, the Romanians send a whole corps, another corps, the Seventh Corps, to help in the Battle of Kirch. Um, the Romanian motorized units, the Corny Detachment, um, is a cavalry detachment that's with few, and then it's part of this Grodek Brigade that's like half Romanian uh, mechanized, you know, cavalry, plus some Roma from German units. That's like one of the main, you know, kind of mobile forces of Manstein. They're able to inflict this major defeat at Kirch, which lots of people know about. I'm not going to get into details. Um, less well known is also the, this Izium battle, which becomes the second battle of Kharkov, where the Soviets attack. The Romanians actually have a full corps there. So that yellow shaded area with the sixth, sixth corps that was doing occupation duties, because yeah. of this breakthrough at Izium, the Germans kept asking for Romanian troops. And so eventually they keep sending divisions in the middle of like, from starting in. Um, January, they're forced marching divisions from, you know, southern Ukraine, where these Romanian troops are supposed to just doing occupation duty. They're shoving them into Izium. Like, they're arriving with tons of frostbite, without heavy artillery or even any of their artillery. And they're just throwing them in to fill gaps. And by the summer, when they have the Second Battle of Kharkov, which inflicts this major defeat on the Soviets, there's about 60,000 um, Romanian troops in Sixth Corps part of the German 17th Army. They don't play a major role in the battle, they, but they hold part of the pocket, which is still important. And they're under um, uh, General um, Cornelio over here, the happy kind of, the jolly looking guy in his garrison cap, um, uh, who's the son of a World War I uh, war hero. Uh, so let's move move forward. Um, here's a little bit more propaganda, like that, they're, that there's, they're feeding soldiers. You can see this map of Romania underneath the Troitsa, which is like this kind of a cross, wooden cross. So it's you can see they've they've gotten back Bessarabia and Bukovina, but there's still this black spot in northern Transylvania. So reminding soldiers to hold on to what we've got. We've got to keep fighting. And if we want that 
Northern Transylvania, we got to keep fighting. Um, and then the center is this wonderful image for Easter, which is showing like the resurrected Christ coming down, blessing um, German Romanian soldiers. And if you zoom in, there is a massive amount of Soviet troops surrendering. Um, and, you know, this is right before Kirch and the second battle of Kharkov. So for a lot of Romanian soldiers, there is this kind of like spring renewal of optimism, you know, that maybe we can defeat the Soviets this year. Like we were really close. The Germans were really close last year and now we can do it this year. You know, there's just going to be this kind of resurrection of our war aims. Uh, um, uh, and this is harking back to the, to the title of your book uh, and your, your idea that this is a, a still a motivated army. It's still the, the propaganda, the, the people back home. It's, this is, the, I'm thinking of that when we talk about the Italian involvement in Stalingrad, and we'll get to Stalingrad later on, there's that attack and retreat film made in the 50s, which is completely portraying the idea that the Italians are effect, almost prisoners of the Germans at this point. They don't want to be there. They've got no hope. The Romanian story is somewhat different. Yeah, I mean, the Romanians, when they get to Stalingrad, they weren't enjoying it. But because of propaganda like this and the underlying ideological beliefs, their worldview, they knew what they were doing out there. They knew that they were trying to root out this, this supposed threat. You see this last image, right? It says uh, it's the day of the family of the soldier, which is an image of this mother and child surrounded by weapons and, you know, artillery in this kind of protective bubble. And it says um, they protect our country we we take care of their family so this gender role here of like the men are out there fighting to protect the women right and so there's very much this idea that if you know we don't destroy communism it's going to be back it, it came and broke the borders in 1940 there's there literally is our article saying if we don't root out jewish bolshevism it's going to take over our country and all these soldiers many of whom have committed war crimes right you know, not just against Jews, but also they've in Crimea, they're fighting partisans and, you know, basically summarily executing people, burning down villages, very like the Germans, really brutal policies. You commit all these crimes. And you, if you believe that there's this evil Jewish communist threat, that if the Red Army comes back and occupies Romania, right, you're only going to believe that there's going to be your family, you know, mm. treated the same way. And that's also a major reason why the Romanian army will keep fighting even when they um, start losing the war or uh, when they obviously know that they're losing the war. Um, and then um, quick, you know, really famous. There's tons of books on this. But once again, the Romanians, they were part of the siege of, of Sevastopol. It's really important that all that fighting in Kirch in the spring is only possible because the Mountain Corps is helping to bottle up Sevastopol, right? So there's Romanian troops not involved at Kirch, but over here at Sevastopol, who are just basically sitting in trenches, making sure the Soviets don't try to, you know, um, get out and attack the Romanian, the German army from the rear. Um, I don't want, once again, there's a lot on this. Um, Romanians are usually kind of mentioned. I don't want to get into too much detail, but yeah, their Romanians were involved in this kind of major seizure, you know, major battle over Sevastopol. Um, at the, at the uh, I think they take the city like July 4th, July 3rd, something like that. Um, and well, they're doing a very good job, Grant, in, in whetting our appetites for future examinations of a deeper dive into some of these campaigns. Because as you said at the beginning, the whack a mole idea, they've only turned up in the narrative in previous versions when it's kind of appropriate for the author. But actually, there's this consistent involvement in key campaigns and battles that 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 has somehow not been um, understood by a lot of a lot of people who would consider themselves kind of Eastern Front aficionados. Yeah. So with you have now we get into Case Blue, and it's really interesting. So there's this remobilization, right? I said most of the Fourth Army and some of Third Army had been demobilized. Um, interestingly, I didn't. I forgot to mention Third Army stops stops being an operational command um, between October of forty one. And um, June of 42, it becomes an administrative command. It's, a, it's just in charge of like supplies and administrative functions and discipline of all Romanian troops from um, east of the Dniester River all the way to the Dnieper River. So like something like a thousand miles or something. But it's not actually doing any operations. The 
Romanian corps and divisions are being controlled by the Germans. Uh, but we're going to have third army is going to go back to being operational in it in the summer here. But the Romanian army remobilizes many of these divisions, fleshed out the train. They they've gotten new conscripts, trained them up using experienced guys. Um, they've also all that captured Soviet you know equipment. They've actually you know helped. They're using some of that plus um, German deliveries and plus you know their own production. Um, and so there's these Echelon 1 divisions. The Romanian army divides them into two. Echelon 1 basically is any division that is already on the front. And they're not as they're not going to be able to re-equip them. They're kind of fought down. But these guys are more experienced, and some of them are getting re-equipped from, like, captured stuff from Kharkov, second part of Kharkov, or, you know, at Kirch, right? Um, and then you have Echelon 2 divisions. These are the divisions being rearmed and retrained that are going to be transferred Based, they haven't seen any combat really since Odessa, and they're going to be deployed originally down to the Caucasus, but um, they actually get sent up to the Don Bend, um, northeast uh, or northwest of Stalingrad. So you have these two kind of echelons, right, um, that the Romanian army has. Um, once again, so like the, and the same thing, the, the Model A Cartier General, after the fall of, of Odessa, it had gone home. It turned back into the general staff. It wasn't doing any kind of military operations staff work. They just left it all to you know the Germans. But as part of deploying all these Echelon II units, they deploy the Model Cartier General, the the great uh, general headquarters to Rostov, and they're basically there to help coordinate um, all the deployment of these Romanian troops. And there's this idea that after the fall of Stalingrad, that the Romanians um, will create an army group Antonescu again. That you'll using Romanian third and fourth armies, fourth army which will you know, uh, which is going to arrive. That they will um, with the German sixth army kind of create an army group on the on the Volga, and you'll have army group. Um, they not, it doesn't come to fruition, uh, obviously, but they they do create something called the Dawn Staff, which is supposed mm -hmm. to take over and do that. Uh, and, and this is when you have a peak of 460,000 soldiers being sent out and they're going to the Caucasus. You have, uh, you ha so in this, you can see as part of Case Blue, Cavalry Corps is sent um, down into the Caucasus. The Mountain Corps is going to stay. It's kind of fought out. They leave them in Crimea to do occupation duty, fight partisans. And then the Sixth Corps at Kharkov is actually the first one to come to um, Stalingrad. You can see on this map, it's kind of this long route. It shows up, it, it marches all along with the keeping up with German panzers and takes up position south of Stalingrad. And so they're there since the beginning of August, uh, fighting kind of trench warfare. And they're going to deploy another corps there. As you can see here, this map has a better um, indication. So the third army, the remaining third army is kind of, it's a, you think that it's you associate it with what I was just talking about in Barbarossa, but it actually that command detaches, and it's not with any of those echelon one units it was commanding. It actually is going to take over all these echelon two units. So basically, third army headquarters goes to the Don Bend. You can see it here on this map, and um, it's taking over these cores that were at Odessa rather than. Um, you know, the troops that have been commanding. And then 4th Army Headquarters actually isn't showing up. Um, it doesn't um, It doesn't show up until like October, and it doesn't have operational control. They bring in a, the, another core from the Caucasus, arrives late October, early November, um, south of Stalingrad. Um, so it's a misnomer to say Romanian 4th Army before that, because it's really the, the German 4th Panzer Army. And I think that's kind of a post-war, it makes it more simplistic to say the Fourth Army, and I think it also then pushes any fault for what happens at Stalingrad onto the Romanian Fourth Army rather than the German Fourth Panzer Army, which actually had control of those troops when the, the German um, offensive goes on. And this came up um, in the sidebar, Grant, where I, I'm, I'm making a comparison also to North Africa in the post-war writing about the German military is that the Romanians were used as the scapegoat uh, in Stalingrad and the Eastern Front, just as the Germans used the Italians as the scapegoat 
in North Africa and in fact downplayed the time as the Italians saved the Germans' arse and arses and, and, and in this case downplayed the cases that you've been highlighting so well of the Romanian army actually being a major factor in the Eastern Front campaign. So it's that it's this idea of historiography of who's been telling the story for whom and at what point. And it's really refreshing to under, to put this back into a into a more modern understanding and context. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very important. And, you know, just one last mention that backs go back one more slide. So I don't want I can't get into it, but we forget the Romanians, right? They're there in the south of Stalingrad since August. They arrive in September although the third army doesn't take over until the middle of October um, on the Don Bend. So there are several months of them fighting trench warfare and they're out in these steps, right? So we always think of the battle of Stalingrad being in Stalingrad, that city fighting, but the battle is actually this wider swath of yeah. territory. And a lot of it is actually like, tr you know, trench warfare on the step, including the Italians and Hungarians, which are to the uh, left flank of the Romanians. Uh, but just I can't get into it, but that's a whole other you know, discussion about the Stalingrad battle. No one talks about the weeks that the remains are there beforehand. They only talk about when they crack during Operation Uranus, which we'll get to now. And, and you're, you know, I love it when people say we can't get into it now because it just means that we've got more things we can do in the future. It's this constant understanding we're all having that when we think we know about a subject we realize that we're only at the beginning of the tunnel of a subject and there's a light at the other end of the tunnel there's always another le level of detail and information and and these this this particular aspect i don't think has been talked about enough but yeah let's get to the battle of stalingrad so you know i don't want to get too much into stalingrad because pretty much everybody knows the big um the big points um the things i want to point out is that we usually just think of Romanians surrendering, like this photo we have in the bottom left of this columns of Romanians, and we have this idea that these they didn't resist. The thing is, there was a uh, a supply crisis before this. The Germans were the German supply commanders were actually telling Hitler to pull back to the Don Bend because they couldn't even supply the Germans, and train loads of supplies stopped showing up to Fourth Army, and only a few showed up to Third Army. So like they're not even getting, so like Fourth Army is actually a lot of their units are almost out of ammunition. And a lot of these remaining units will actually fight to like until they're out of ammo and like or out of artillery rounds, you know, and they just can't do anything else. Plus, the, the Soviets have have so much equipment lined up. But it's important to point out there is this uh, uh, Lascar Lascar group. They actually fight um, for days, right? And there's this mini envelopment. Everyone for like they act like the Romanians just completely run and don't even fight. A they either get steamrolled and or they and then they start running, or there's this Lascar group which actually fights and holds on for days and days until it's basically completely surrounded and out of ammunition and getting shelled from every side. Like you can't ask an ally to do more, right? Mm -hmm. And they're out in the empty step. They don't have any like buildings. They can't retreat into a Stalingrad like the Germans do later in the pocket. Um, there is uh, several. There's a, a whole remaining division. The 20th gets stuck in the pocket. And then the remnants of the 1st Cavalry Division also get stuck in the pocket. The other thing people don't talk about, which is this other photo, is that you can't hold, you can't even try to have a relief attempt without the remnants of 3rd Army and 4th Army reforming and helping the Germans hold the line against, uh, along the Chir River. And then this other image of these Romanian infantry with a German assault gun, right? Romanian 4th Army remnants are really important to supporting the Panzers that you had. Um, Dr. Pritt Brutar talk about this battle, right? This a, a relief attempt without the remaining infantry to help occupy certain areas and cavalry to, to help protect the flank, it wouldn't have even got as far as it got as it got. But no one ever talks about that. that the Romanians are actually still fighting. Everyone just thinks like, oh, the first few days, the Romanians are overwhelmed, you know, whack them all down. They all surrendered. Well, actually, they're still fighting until January, February, um, outside of Stalingrad, and then also inside Stalingrad. Uh, next slide. Um, so this, so if the, this is the um, commander, um, Nikolai Tataranu of the Romanian 20th uh, Division. He um, takes over command of all Romanian troops, including those ones from the 1st Cavalry Division in the pocket. And so they're the, the, very, the very bottom of the pockets where the 20th 
Romanian infantry division is. And then the, the cavalry men are kind of used as like um, to fill gaps in the hole on the Western side. Um, he's pretty brutal. He's, he authorizes gendarmes, including German gendarmes, to shoot Romanian soldiers if they aren't, um, you know, willing to fight. And he says only Romanian soldiers who fight get fed. So, but while he does that, near the end of the battle, he flies out of the pocket, goes back to Bucharest, and um, tells uh, asks Antonescu that he's well, tells Antonescu he's carrying a message, asking for more aircraft. Uh, for, you know, he's from Paulus. He's like, Paulus sent me, and Antonescu loses it and says he has to go back into the pocket and, or be or risk being court-martialed and shot. Um, Totoranu starts heading back, but then gets sick, um, which I think he really was probably physically ill, but he actually never ends up back there. And he only kind of comes out of a cloud um, because Hitler then claims that he ordered him to leave because he wanted to, you know, save some of the Romanian generals, which I think is complete crap, but I haven't really, I need to look more into this. But interestingly, Tatoranu was a um, a friend of uh, Jakobic, who also didn't think that they should do a maximum um, commitment. He was on the general staff, and so he gets demoted and sent out as a division commander, and so that might not be one reason he's trying to get away, because that he saw this whole thing coming. Um, and then you see here the, the, the Romanian 20th Division, I think, collapses in the late January, and then the last Romanian soldiers, some of these first cavalry guys, surrender with the Germans at the beginning of February. And you can see them in this photo. They have the, the they're kind of in the middle. They have like the sheepskin caps on, and the rest of these guys are Germans um, taken in the pocket. Next slide. So a little comparison. Once again, this is, there's this difference between the Romanian army and the other uh, the Axis armies. So the Italian army, I'm not gonna go through all the things, but it takes so many casualties, they pull every Italian survivor off. There are no more Italian troops, rest of the Eastern Front. The Hungarian Second Army also shattered. Um, and it only, you know, they then leave only two divisions doing occupation duty. You look at the Romanians, they lose a ton of troops. They keep fighting. Um, then they finally pull them off. Um, the survivors, about 70,000 of them. Um, the Germans actually want to keep them near Rostov, and the Romanians say, hey, these guys are completely not good for combat, and they we need to bring them all the way back and refit you know, to help rebuild them. Um, and they come to a con the, uh, compromise of combat troops, because most of the guys who got captured were combat troops, and it's the supply guys who are able to run and get away but they leave the combat the combat troops near the Azov Sea, while the rest of the survivors, who are supply guys, go back to Transnistria or Romania. And there's almost enough that with a few more additions, they create a whole division as like a coastal guard division there on the Azov Sea from these survivors, which you know it's kind of incredible. But in, in addition, you have six divisions still fighting in the Caucasus, plus three divisions. Uh, plus two more divisions in uh, Crimea, the Mountain Corps. Um, and then you have a few more divisions still occupying Transnistria. So compare that to the other you know, Italian or Hungarian armies' commitment or the, their commitments after this battle. The Romanians are still throwing in, you know, they still have like 100,000 troops mm. on the Eastern Front. But the loss of soldiers, especially equipment at Stalingrad, has just kind of gutted the Romanian army. Want to move uh, next slide? Yeah. So th this is where the most of the those hundred thousand soldiers are still fighting. Um, in this quixotic Hitler decision for a springboard in the Caucasus, he doesn't want to give up everything in the Caucasus. He wants. He thinks he's going to have a new summer offensive in 1943. Um, Antonescu agrees. He doesn't have a lot of choice, but really interestingly he's able to get hard currency and gold out of Hitler um, plus promises of new weapons. No other ally is able to do this. And this is not just, this is often cited because, oh, Romanians have oil, but it's not just the oil that Romania is important to the Nazi war effort. It's also these soldiers. The act, the Romanian mm -hmm. army is very important to the, to the um, uh, German war effort. 
Um, but when we kind of talked about how in 1941, the remains were in a secondary theater, 1942, it's like primary theater during Case Blue. Now they're not even, they're kind of very in mainly a third, a tertiary, you know, like third rate theater, which is this Kuban bridgehead in the Caucasus. It's really not, it's, it's, it's a dumb use of troops. Um, there's, but the Romanians provide about a third of them. At one point, they have about 40% of the troops in the Kuban bridgehead are Romanians. Um, the Romanians are starting to show these guys, most of them have been uh, are echelon one troops. They've been fighting since, um, you know, Operation Barbarossa. You have a few battalions that refuse to go back into the lines. The Germans use this as an excuse to do amalgamation. They kind of break up... Ex- they break up several of the mountain divisions and, cal- and infantry divisions and kind of plug them into German divisions. So you have the German firepower, but you're using Romanian infantry to kind of fill the gaps. Although there's still several Romanian divisions that are well-motivated and they, they don't break them up. There's a mountain division and a, that's on the northern part of it. So there are there, so there is some like weakening of motivate, but they kind of re- once again, you kind of spring comes. The Romanians who are there, like they go, there's inspections and the morale actually kind of recovers and they have these really good trenches, always prepared positions and they hold on for a long time. But there's all these other, you know, they start losing in Ukraine. The Nazis get, you know, the Germans getting pushed back. They eventually have to, uh, they actually have to evacuate this uh, in the beginning of October of 43. Oh, um, I have that Stuka there. That's a Romanian Stuka. You know, they actually, um, they were based at Mariupol, which I'm sure a lot of the, we've been hearing about that in the news. They would fly over the Azov Sea, bomb the Soviet trenches for the Romanians and Germans and the Kuban Bridgehead and fly back. Um, but, you know, what, you know so, so interesting, a little air aspect um, there. If you want to move to the next slide. So once they've evacuated, um, the bulk of the Romanian troops, they're all pretty much in Crimea. Um, and they're very soon cut off um and they so they call it encircled crimea even though you can't it's not really encircled right it's just cut off but they call it encircled crimea um and i don't want to get this you know the romanians they have the cavalry corps and the mountain corps here um and this is at this point rakovica like i mentioned he got as uh, he actually left back in the beginning of 43 when it, when it became clear it was going to be like trench warfare in the Kuban Bridgehead, he pieced out. He got a better job back in Bucharest. And they had a new general to take over, um, Chiliuk. Um, uh, and then once Crimea is encircled, Avramescu does the same thing. Avramescu finds a better job uh, further to the rear, um, taking over Third Corps in Transnistria, which is training troops. Um, and he gets replaced by General Hugo Schwab, who is an ethnic German. Um, and you can see him in that photo. He's a shorter guy in the Romanian uniform, which is different from the other German ones. And I think in part, they choose him because he has a German name so that the Romanians can kind of project to the rest of the world that like they aren't involved. They're trying to minimize like why they're still fighting and trying to like justify it. And then they can kind of saddle this ethnic German that most of the Romanian officers don't like with the, with the crappy job of having to um, organize a doomed defense of Crimea. Um, they actually hold out, like the Romanians help um, hold this, uh, stop some attacks in the winter. And they hold on in this nasty trench warfare on the Shivash, the Shivash Sea which is that upper right photo. It's like this muddy kind of boggy like area. Um, you know, it's, it's nasty. There's the kind of the worst morale is, issues are here. So this idea, this like kind of myth of Romania being a reluctant axis becomes most true in, you know, late in 43, 44 in Crimea. There are some regiments with very low morale, some units that will break just under enemy artillery fire, like, you know, just having a bombardment will cause them to retreat. Um, But that's not all troops and especially, and that's not, and definitely not the officers. And um, uh, the Soviets, they have a they reconquer it in April, May. Um, 
the Romanians help organize and provide most of the ships for a massive kind of Dunkirk, you know, evacuation by sea from Sevastopol to Constanza. Um, and then those units are kind of, most of them are demobilized, uh, the survivors. Um, so, but the thing is, it can be really interesting is that morale for the rest of the army is going to be very different than for these guys. Cause these are echelon. Once again, these are many of these troops been fighting since, you know, Barbarossa. Some of them been there two plus years, haven't gotten leave. You know, they obviously know the war's losing. They've escaped the Kuban bridgehead. Now they want to get out of Crimea. So the Crimea is not really representative. The morale was lower, but it's not really representative of the entire experience of the Romanian army for the whole war. But, but it's when it's it, it, most... Sense, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Graham, but... Yeah, go ahead. After two years of combat, even if you had been winning every battle in that two years of combat, we know now from studies of men in war that everybody just starts waning after a while. I mean, it, it was happening in the winter of '44. To the, to the Western Allies, you know, if you've been in a British or American unit that's been fighting for two years, even if you, even though you feel you're winning the war, you've just been at it for so long, your morale's shot to pieces. It's just, you can only take so much. So, yes, there's actually a situation to be, to influence the, re, the mor bad morale, but it's going to have happened anyway, surely. I mean, that length of time in combat is just going to wear it out on anybody. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, no one really says, like, oh, the Germans, you know, they aren't motivated. Well, but the Germans are having morale problems for the same exact reasons. They know they're losing, yeah. but they're still willing to keep fighting. No one says the Romanian, the Germans aren't willing to fight. But with the Romanians, everyone's like, oh, they have morale problems. Obviously, they aren't really committed. I'm like, well, then why do they hold on in Crimea until April? Right? Like, yes, also, the Germans are. Sorry, again, sorry, I'm sorry, so sorry to interrupt. But is that also again yeah. because people know what happens further on in the timeline? So they're looking for, they're looking for, for for the a, a, a cause of the of the, the switch in 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 allegiance that happens later on by saying, well, it was always going to happen. They were all they were on the verge of breaking at this point here. It's 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 foreshadowing something that because you know the full story. Yeah, I definitely think it's 2020 vision hindsight. Point away vision in hindsight that they, oh, the Romanians eventually switch sides. So let's find, let's, let's find you know, the trigger. Obviously, the trigger. they must yeah. not be motivated. But it's it's also the Romanians are putting this out there. Antonescu's regime is actually spreading this myth during the war in 1943 because they're trying to get the British and the Americans to side with them against the Soviets. So mm -hmm. they actually in neutral countries like Switzerland, you know, they're like, oh. And, you know, Antonescu is ordering his diplomats to tell the British and the Americans, well, we never really wanted to be in this war. We only fought for Bessarabia, and we can't get out of Crimea because they would just shoot our soldiers like they do the Italians. And, oh, me, Antonescu, I never wanted to persecute the Jews. Like, I never did that. So, like, this myth that is has actually started as propaganda by the Romanians to justify what they were doing. So I'm like, the fact that so many people believe in it still is somewhat strange to me because I'd be like believing Nazi, you know, uh, arguments about, oh, we're just fighting for the defense of the Third Reich because the Soviets are evil men. You know, I mean, like, you, you know, you, you understand what I'm saying? It's kind of strange that we take this propaganda started at face value, you know, but this propaganda started by the regime that did these terrible things. We take it at face value. I'm like, oh, yeah, OK, yeah. You guys eventually, you know, okay, you didn't really want to be there. Well, just it's complete hogs hogwash, in my opinion. Yeah, but, and and it's that standard thing. I mean, how many times in history and recent history have leaders started to kind of change their story because they have sort of seen that the path they're going down is maybe going to end up um, bringing them own their their own downfall. So they start to kind of sow some seeds of of a cover story. But when it all goes wrong, no, no, I was but it. I mean, we could we could do an entire series of shows on on leaders and politicians who who uh, who do that in the course of history. So it's yeah, we shouldn't be we shouldn't always believe these people in power uh, what they're saying and what they're thinking is is not always the same thing. But we'll 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 move on. We next slide now. Yeah. Yeah. Think, yeah. So we'll move through this quick. But this is just showing this long retreat over this kind of year and a half um, from. All that advanced in Stalingrad to the Kuban Bridgehead to Crimea. And then now we're going to talk about 
um, the Yash Front, the defense of Romania, um, that in March of 44, the Soviets start overrunning northern uh, Romania, uh, they retake northern Bukovina, northern Bessarabia, uh, northern Transylvania, uh, Transnistria, um, and then they also take the rest of Transnistria, as you can see in this map. Um, and then let's move forward. Um, so before there's, uh, this is the end. So like, as I was saying, like, there's kind of like this depressed morale in Crimea. Is in, but now um, you have a new mobilization. Which I, this, this number always astonishes me, that they mobilize a million men in, 19, in um, the spring, summer of 1944. And I mean, this is after three years of war, after terrible losses at Stalingrad, right? I mean, they always they were always kind of averaging about eight hundred thousand, but they're able to push it up to a million men. This is almost as many men as they mobilized back in nineteen forty, um, when they when they did hadn't lost this ter all these territories. Um, they're actually, but they're having to do this. They're scraping the bottom of the barrel. They're starting to um, mobilize teenagers, you know, and put them in. And so there are a lot of men, but some of them aren't men. They're younger boys. They never get down to like. Below that, they never get down to like kind of Nazi craziness of like preteens, um, but they are mobilizing, starting to mobilize eight, 16, 15 to 18 year olds rather than 20, 21 year olds, which they had been. Um, but they, they have, they're able with the help of the Germans, um, there's a lot of, you know, the, the, a lot of the German armored divisions are retreating into Romania they're able to stabilize the front in April. So the Soviets seem about to knock out Romania. You know, they've taken over Crimea. They seem to be about to knock out Romania. The U.S. Air Force uh, hits um, Romania for the first time at the beginning of April. It seems like Romania is about to collapse, but instead, these the Fourth Army they re, they remobilize Fourth Army, um, and they also have a Third Army, which is down to the south. Um, and they're able to uh, create a line, and the Soviets are overextended. The weather is bad. There's lots of late winter snowstorms, so mud, all that kind of stuff. All and then then terrain becomes hilly in Moldavia. So on the Yash front, and like I said, they they're mobilizing these troops. A lot of them are fresh and new, young men. So their morale might not be their experience isn't great but their morale is better than the, these guys who've been fighting in Crimea for years, right? And they're defending the homeland. So once again, there's like that motivation is still kind of consistent. They still fear even more so in some ways, the Soviet army, because it's right here on our doorstep. And there's always rumors about the Soviets raping Romanian women in occupied Northern in Bukovina and Northern uh, Bessarabia, right? So it's like, this is like the do or die. So morale is actually, you know, fairly good, you know, not that they think they're going to win, but like that they're, they're motivated to fight. Um, so by May, they've it's solidified. There's a couple of like a little German counterattack supported by the Romanians at the end of May, beginning of June. Um, but then after that, um, you have this trench warfare. Um, and so this April, June, April is, is to June is kind of like the first Yash Kishino offensive. So the, becomes named later because the Soviets are trying to get to Yash and Kishino because Yash is the capital of Moldavia and Kishino or Kishinev is the uh, capital of um, Bessarabia. And so they think if they can take those cities, it'll cause the Antonescu regime to collapse and Romania to exit the war, but they can't quite do it. And so they turn over to trench warfare. Um, the Germans begin to withdraw these powerful um, Panzer and um, uh, Panzer Grenadier divisions from Romania because they need them up north because you have, a, you know, um, Operation Bagration that's overrunning Poland and coming towards Germany. And so they start pulling them out in late June throughout July until there's only like two or three um, Panzer divisions plus the Romanian armored division, which has been rebuilt after being destroyed outside Stalingrad. Um, so that is demoralizing to because the Romanians see 
that these German tanks are leaving and they real they know from their experience that they're not well equipped enough and well experienced enough to hold off the Soviets. Um, there's this weird command arrangement that gets set up under Army Group South, uh, German Army Group South Ukraine. The Germans want to kind of control the Romanians and they don't trust them as much and they don't want to give, they aren't going to create Army Group Antonescu again. They don't want to put a Romanian commander even kind of pretending to be in control, right? So they, they create army group, they create with the kind of the, the sub-army groups, one of which is under General Dumitrescu, Army Group Dumitrescu, which is only two corps um, down in the south. Their basic one is guarding a bit of the Dniester River against the Soviets, and then the other corps is basically a, a coastal defense. But then the other part of that is the German Sixth Army, which is the big German army, which has been reconstituted from Sixth Army destroyed at Stalingrad. So really the German Sixth Army, it's, you know, it's five, six, seven corps or something like that. So it's, it can do what it wants. It's just, it, it's, you know, but they give titular command to Dumitrescu. And then there's German army group Voller, which is the Romanian big army, fourth army, which has, I think four corps. Um, whereas German eighth army is like two. But the Romanians are providing the most of the troops at the Yash front. They put the German in control there. So once again, they, they, it's this weird command arrangement. It's and then it's, but it's really what I how I term it is amalgamation on a mm. massive scale. So what they were doing in like the Kuban, they're now with like regiments and battalions by kind of mixing them together, so that you have German, you know, a German battalion reinforcing a Romanian, you know, brigade or a Romanian, you know, regiment pushed into a German division. Now here you have like a Romanian, you know, corps that's actually got a German division shoved in there to help it out or a German corps that's weak with a, with a Romanian division shoved into it. So it's, 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 it's somewhat, it's, it's designed um, in part, right. To kind of deny Romanian, kind of limit how independently the Romanians can operate, but it's also a, a, a sign of trust. So it's, it, mm -hmm. it's often cited as like, Oh, they don't trust the Romanians anymore, which is kind of true. But it's actually also a sign of trust that the Romanians have oh, have always kind of cooperated so well with the Germans that they're willing to put up with amalgamation so that they can and that they collaborate well. If you read Manstein's memoir, he actually specifically says that that the Romanians always are able to like kind of collaborate well at the at the command level. And so I think it's often seen as kind of mistrust, but I think this command arrangement is actually like. A, a, an example of how you know it codependent like how trust how much trust actually was and why when Romania switches sides it catches not you know Hitler and most of the commanders off guard because they really didn't think the Romanians were going to switch sides because they so far they've been their most committed um, ally and it's only after the fact that then they kind of act like oh we saw this coming if you read like the memoirs they pretend like they see it coming but they really don't I think it's because they trust the Romanians. They think they're going to fight, and they so really do. So sounds like a good. The, the, it seems like the best words you used in that little bit there. Codependent. It's trust is maybe too strong, but codependent. Kind of we're, we're in it together now. Yeah, I, 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 that seems to be the best language you've used so far. But the, yeah, I mean the Romanians. Was... There is resentment of the Germans growing. There is, you know, there's like they're understanding that like they'd be second class citizens in a Nazi Europe. But the Romanians need the Germans to stand up against the Soviets because, once again, ideology, yeah. right? They really fear this. And so, and once again, the Germans need the Romanians because the Germans are spread too thin. They won't be able to do this on their own. Um, and then kind of this, on the 20th of August, 1944, you have what's called the second Yashkishino Offensive. And this is, you know, when the Soviets go on the offensive and they rel rather rather quickly within a few days break through uh, the Romanian fourth army's defenses and the Romanian third army, which once again, there are German troops mixed in here. So after the war, it's easy to blame the Romanians, but the Romanian fourth army actually has, and the Romanian third army and the Romanian and the German, you know, sixth army, they're all mixed up. So you can't just blame this on the Romanians because the, the Germans are, are like with them too. And, it's really like 
yes, there's some depressed morale, but I think it's fairly okay. And it's more just the fact the Romanians aren't as well trained, aren't as well equipped. And even the Germans can't take this. You know, the German, you know, the Germans can't, the, the German uh, Sixth Army is just a massive infantry and it can't escape. And so this disaster that's unfolding leads to a royal coup. I have to go to the next slide. Yeah. So a small group, a small clique of officers who don't agree with Antonescu around the king are able to arrest him and his and his government in a palace coup. So once again, this isn't like the there is no kind of revolt against the war by soldiers. A lot of the soldiers who are fighting in the Yash, second Yashkishino offensive, you know, all of a sudden find out like they break out, they get to a German unit, and the Germans are like, oh. Hey Romania, you guys switch sides. You're out of the war, and the Romanians are shocked. Like I've read these, you know, memoirs by these soldiers who are just like, we were let down by our by our leaders, right? So this isn't some like popular, you know, rejection of the of the war. Like a lot of people accept it very quickly because they're so tired of the of the war and all the fighting. But it's a small group around the king that switches sides, which then means the Romanians stop fighting. Um, and then, um, although it takes several days, right? It doesn't just stop on a dime. Like I said, a lot of these guys don't find out for a day or two. And some of it, like the third army tries to break out <laughs> and, you know, it gets surrounded. Um, you know, it takes another, you know, and so it's, even though they've technically surrendered. Um, so this is called, after the war, the turning of arms. It's like this brave, popular, you know, Romania switch of sides. And really, it was a small group, you know, who organized this. None of the generals are told. Um, oh, and Rakovica has. Um, it was once again. Rako, Fourth Army was under Rakovica, and once I want to hit him one more time. He went on vacation back in like June, and he never goes back to his command because he knows that there's going to be a defeat coming. He later claims, "Oh, I was part of the conspiracy," but I don't believe that. I need to do more research into this, but I think this is just him like justifying after the fact. Right. That really he just wanted to avoid being associated with a defeat. And so Avramescu actually is like, and then Steflia, they're, they're in tech technical command. Anyway, so that's basically the end of Romania's Holy War, where they are, they've switched sides. There's an armistice that's signed. A huge number of Romanian soldiers are taken captive. Um, many, twice as many as at Stalingrad um, are casualties, you know, if you count them just as casualties. Or I think it's even, yeah, I think it's like 70,000 are captured. I need to do it, right? I can't think of the numbers, but still, it's like 150,000 Romanian troops are captured at Yash Kishinev because the coup happens before there's an armistice. So the Soviets keep treating the Romanians as enemies. So they just keep capturing them for another, like, you know, two weeks um, and only let some of them go to, you know, to fight for them. So there's, there's this myth that the Germans put out that, like, the Romanians, like, turn and immediately start fighting with the Germans. And that's not true at all. The Romanians actually keep fighting with the Germans for several more days. And then most of them are captured rather than like turning on the Germans. Um, there is this attempt of an anti-fascist crusade. It's never as popular, this, this, this propaganda. The Romanian army does mobilize kind of like its final reserves. They help reconquer Northern Transylvania. Um, they fight into Hungary. They play a part in boot the siege of Budapest, and then they're like sent to fight in the mountains in Slovakia until the end of the war. Um, it's not very glorious, and actually morale, I think, I argue, I think is probably worse than at any time, even in, than in Crimea, because they're seeing the Soviets occupy their country, and they're getting letters about Soviet soldiers committing abuses and crimes, mm -hmm. and then they're being sent as cannon fodder in this terrible mountain fighting in Slovakia. Um, and it's, there's about 240,000 soldiers at its peak, which is right, like, half the size of the biggest, con, con, you, know, you know, contribution to the Eastern Front um, wow. during the war. Well, brilliant. Um, and uh, so, oh, yeah, I think that kind of wraps it up. I think there has to be a different episode to talk about um, last nine months. But um, any more questions from the group? Also, here's a flyer for my book if you order it through cornell university press i think this is still a good discount i think the i think the code is still works so i think you can still get a discount 
And if you're interested in more Romania stuff, um, I am po I'm posting stuff on Twitter every day. Um, and yeah, questions. Yeah, we'll do, we've got three here. I think we'll we'll, we'll leave it at that. So um, the first one is, uh, what were Romanian soldiers captured by the Soviets treated humanely or shipped off to gulags, etc.? Um, the Romanian soldiers were treated. I mean, the whole R Soviet prisoner of war system was a, a shambles. They didn't put a lot of effort into it. The Soviet army could barely feed itself. The Romanians are treated a little bit better than the Germans, but they were also put into, um, you know, prisoner of war camps. Some of them, you know, were starving. I don't think many go into the gulag system. And the Romanians tend to, the bulk of the Romanian prisoners of war are sent home. Um, I think um, they, it's not finished until 56, I think. But that's like the, but I think the most Romanian soldiers kind of come home a little bit earlier than the big releases of German uh, prisoners of war. And then the ones that are held back are kind of the most committed, once again, ideologically anti-communist. Um, and I've actually read a few interesting uh, memoir, uh, diaries and memoirs about Romanian officers and how they're still kind of hoping in victory well into um, 43 and even 44 based off of rumors from their Soviet guards. So there's still like a hope that the Romania might win or even like a negotiated peace in among, you know, especially officers in these prisoner of war camps. So once again, very strong ideological motivation that and tells you how deep rooted and long lasting ideological beliefs can be. If, if, if years later, when clearly the writing has been on the wall, you're still believing the same stuff you were believing 10 years ago. It proves how powerful those messages were. And we'll do another one from Woody Lee here, a namesake of mine. How were the Romanian atrocities dealt with by the Allies in the aftermath of the war? Um, so the because Romania switches sides, they actually have a government still in power. There is a uh, Allied Control Commission, Soviet, um, in Romania. Um, so... But because you have this new government that's trying to like include and be democratic, the Romanians actually do most of their own prosecuting. Right. They start. They set up people's tribunals, one in Bucharest for Romanian crimes, and then one in um, northern Transylvania, in Cluj, which is in northern Transylvania, addressing um, crimes under the Hungarian occupation. Um, there's only a few hundred and only a few hundred and only a few of those are actually like taken to trial. Um, it's interesting. There actually is arrests of commanders um, like the fourth army commander is arrested. Uh, the first army commander is arrested um, in 40, late 44, or beginning 45 because of he was, if he was involved in atrocities. So like that's also hurting the motivation of the officer corps in that last nine months of the war when they switched sides, because here and there, like they're getting, and then Avramescu is actually executed. He's um, well, he dies under suspicious circumstances after being arrested by the NKVD. So once again, mm. that's undermining morale. And like you're seeing, you know, officer, you know, generals getting picked off um, like that. Um, but there are once you have these kind of big trial in 45, Another really big one in 46 with Antonescu and they execute Antonescu and a couple others. And then they kind of go away and then there's a resurgence. Once the communists take over, they kind of have a series of war crime trials, investigations um, up through the 50s. But it's only like only a few, a handful of commanders and leaders are punished for the atrocities. Um, and there's a political like these guys are totally guilty. But the ones that are chosen, it's mainly because for political reasons as well, uh, because they want to like kind of you know, take out these war heroes who are could possibly organize anti-communist sentiments. Um, but they are guilty, so like they're not just like a drum drumhead trial. Yeah. So like a lot of Romanians today were like, "Oh, these guys were put on a show trial." Like, yes, they were, but they were super guilty. So. Mm -hmm. And as we found out yesterday, 
to have a perpetrator, you have to identify a crime. And as Adrian said yesterday, they're still uncovering sites of massacres. There are still there are still lots of incidents that have not yet been um, report, um, investigated and uncovered. So, yeah, if there's no crime, obviously there are crimes. You can't have a, a trial of someone if you can't find the crime. So where perhaps we're talking about the Third Reich and the German side of things over in Poland, and we kind of know the crimes and we, we can... We, we know a lot of people slipped through the, the net and weren't brought to trial with, with the Romanian atrocities. There's still a lot of mystery about actually what they did. So it, there's, a, there's a lot more work to be done on this, essentially. Yeah, which is in the favor of a lot of the, gener- the, ger- the remaining commanders. Some of them got yeah. off be- just because they were doing these quick trials and a lot of them they want to get done quickly. So some of these generals were released on insufficient evidence that today we have the evidence like you know, that they would be prosecuted for. Um, and some of them, you know, die in prison. Some of them die, are released and die, um, you know, just of natural causes. Dumi Trescu, I think, he gets, I don't think he gets prosecuted, even though he was wow. super involved or was, would have been responsible. Um, the well, book is going to be published in Romanian. I just saw that. The book is, yeah. is being translated as we speak. It should be um, published in October, I was told by Corint, uh, Editora Corint. Um, I don't know if I will be in Romania, but maybe for a book launch. That's a, it's, yeah, that, that, that's kind of trying to predict current affairs in the world right now. But um, anyway, let's bring things in now. So you've got an open door to come back and expand on any one of these campaigns that you you you, you went over in, a, in an introductory way today and, and, you know, Odessa or the Crimea, whatever you want to, delve into you can come back and do that but right now i'll just remind people what we've got coming up and then i'll come back and say goodbye so one more show in this series of romanian shows tomorrow with vadimir we are talking about the occupation of transnistria and then on friday a completely off the change of subject we're off to uh, macarthur's escape from corregidor uh, on the 80th anniversary of that event there so we're off to, off to the pacific campaign i've had a chat with james zobel who is going to be my historian on there and he is a mine of information about macarthur we have photos you won't have seen before documents you won't have seen before and we will talk about not just the escape and it's a navy story it's, it's more if you're thinking i don't want to hear about douglas macarthur it's more about the u.s navy involvement in getting him out of Corregidor uh, than it is so much macarthur but of course macarthur will come up in a conversation if you're new to the, new to the channel and please don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like the shows. Don't forget to comment afterwards. Thank you for the live chats, but also just take a minute or two afterwards to leave something nice in the comments. It all helps with the algorithm. Views have dropped a little bit in the last few days because of the current affairs. But anyway, thank you very much for your hardy and continued loyal support to what we're doing here. And some of these subject matters are a bit more challenging than just talking about what's the best tank and what's the best aircraft that some YouTube channels do. So thank you for sticking with us through some of these complicated and harrowing and and dis- and disturbing subjects. So, well, that without further ado, I will say thank you very much to Grant for joining us and good luck with the book, uh, the, the actual sales of it, and the good luck with the Romanian publication. And we'll we'll bring you back in the future if that sounds good to you. Yeah, it sounds great. You know, whenever uh, you have another week or another topic like this. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And um, I really enjoyed talking about Romania and World War II. Yeah, well, we we can tell that that's and that and and our 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 result for your enthusiasm is the show you've given us. So there we are. So this is Paul Woodard for World War Two TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow. Thank you for your attention today. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.